Imagine, if you will, a community of learning that couldn't be together. Until now, that was us. But we have a special moment here, and I'm glad to share it with you, where we get to learn together in one room as an actual community. The person who will help us learn today is Friedrich Nietzsche, and we'll be thinking about his book on the genealogy of morals. But first, a reminder of where we've been. We're thinking about philosophy and political thought. In semester one, the term was arranged by tradition, China, India, Europe. In semester two, where we are now, we've arranged the term thematically. First, we thought about self and world, whether selves exist at all, and how they relate to the world. And the relation that we thought about in particular was that of knowledge. How can we come to know things about reality, and what are the limits of our knowledge? Then we turned to politics and society, and we thought about what we owe each other and the best way to live together, and what kind of governance was proper, and the proper balance of power and negotiation between labor and capital, men and women, individual and society. Now we turn to our third and final unit, not just of PPT2, but of the entire PPT sequence. The theme here is looking back. And we look back not just on what we thought about this term, but also the entire project of doing philosophy and political thought. So perhaps a guiding question for you to have in your mind as we complete these last few weeks of the two-semester PPT sequence is just, what is it that we've been doing? Is it any good? What are these traditions that we've been drawing on? What can they teach us, especially in the modern world? People like us, here and now. On that note, I want to introduce several cases from the real world, us, here and now, and ask the question of whether Nietzsche can help us think clearly about these cases. I begin with online bullying. How many of you have bullied someone else online, just talked shit about them, said, said nasty things in some way? I, I saw a hand. Very good. <laughs> How many of you have been bullied? Okay, some hands will go up as well. I see what you guys write about each other. <laughs> This happens. That is not a very curious phenomenon. I want to draw your attention to something a little bit more curious, though, which is the phenomenon of online self-harm. You might wonder, what is that? Well, it's where you make a fake anonymous account and then use it to talk shit about yourself, to create a victimhood for yourself. The research shows that something like 5% of middle and high school students do this, and the number is rising. Interesting, isn't it, that somebody would choose to be a victim? There's a kind of sickness to this, or there's something puzzling that needs explanation, you might think. Nietzsche may be able to help. Sometimes people in positions of even being in the racial, not majority, but supermajority, claim the position of victimhood as if, by virtue of being in that racial supermajority, they're being discriminated against. Sometimes wealthy and powerful celebrities create hoax hate crimes against themselves. This fellow hired two men to beat him up and threatened to lynch him. He's been convicted of this, of course, and will probably see jail time. But you've got to ask, why would somebody who makes $150,000 an episode for a well-known TV show, at the top of his game, why would he want to be a victim? Why would he hire people to brutalize him? Interesting. Interesting. Other rich and famous people do this as well, going on hours-long interviews about how persecuted they are, how oppressed they are, even the most powerful and wealthy people in the world. Now, you might think that I'm now going to go on a rant against this epidemic of hate crime hoaxes or something like that. Now, other scholars have done that. That's not my game here. I don't think that is a deep explanation of what's happening. We can, go, we can do better. And in fact, the phenomenon here is not limited to the political left in the United States. Conservative students do this on college campuses routinely, setting up situations where they appear to be the victim. Local celebrities and influencers do it as well, looking for any chance they can to be canceled so that they can claim the oppressed status. Here's what I notice happening in the abstract. We exchange language or concepts or identities of dominance, aggression, power, status, or control for their opposites. We claim instead victimhood or submission, loss, yielding, or the lack of control. 
Now, again, I do not raise this phenomenon to complain about victimhood culture, as if this were something new that happened only within my lifetime, say. The phenomenon we observe here is human, all too human. Perhaps Nietzsche can help us understand why it came to be. So imagine with me, if you will, that there were a people group defined by exile and slavery, and that out of this people group emerged a local prophet, a rabbi, who lived and then was tortured to death by Roman oppressors. And imagine that this started a new religion, we call it now Christianity, and that these people took as their central ethic not power, not honor, not strength, but instead weakness. The best way to love is to die. And in fact, they took as their central symbol not a sign of triumph, for example, an empty tomb showing that Jesus of Nazareth rose from the dead and still lives. No, they chose a symbol of suffering, of torture, of abject humiliation, the cross. And imagine that they then took over the world. This is more or less what Nietzsche thinks happened to our world, that a small Jewish sect that we now call Christianity took over our ethical concepts and gave to us something new, and something that's a little funky. Here's how one put, poet puts it. The other gods were strong, but thou wast weak. They rode, but thou didst stumble to a throne. But to our wounds, only God's wounds can speak. And not a god has wounds, but thou alone. The Homeric gods were strong. The Christian god died. Here's how the rest of the lecture will unfold. I'll share three pivotal moments from Nietzsche's life that can give us insight into the kind of life he lived and the kind of person he was. I'll share with you some pro tips about how to correctly read Nietzsche and some warnings about how not to misread him. And then I'll spend some time explaining my take on Nietzsche's central analytical tool, which he calls genealogy or the genealogical method, where we probe into the past histories and origins of our moral concepts, our moral emotions, our moral ideas, to figure out what really makes them tick, going deep into human nature and our past. This is our hero, Freddy. What do you see? I see a man with an intense stare, and I see a man with a mighty mustache. I'm going to share with you three episodes from his life, divided in roughly 10-year intervals, so we'll cover about 30 years of his life. At age 24, Nietzsche was appointed not assistant professor, not associate professor, but full professor at Basel. This was quite the intellectual accomplishment. No one did this before, and few have done it after. We, in fact, had the letter of recommendation written on his behalf. I'll read for you a few lines. Never yet have I known a young man or tried to help one along in my field as best as I could who is so mature as early and as young as this Nietzsche. He is now 24 years old, strong, vigorous, healthy, note the mustache, courageous physically and morally, so constituted as to impress those of similar nature. He is the idol, and without wishing it, the leader of the whole younger generation of philologists. You will say I describe a phenomenon. Well, that is just what he is. Now imagine a letter like this had been written about you. What would that do to your ego? What would it do to your head? Well, we can make a few good guesses about what it did to Nietzsche's. His first book, unfortunately, fell stillborn at the press. In The Birth of Tragedy, he argued for an aesthetic ideal according to which the good life integrates not just truth or goodness or other values, but actually beauty in a distinctive way. A striking thesis, but the critics did not like it. And Nietzsche was disappointed and perhaps unsurprisingly eventually resigned on the 10th year anniversary of his time at Basel. Now, in the next 10 years of his life, Nietzsche would be a kind of itinerant intellectual, moving around Europe, staying in Airbnbs for a month or two at a time, and then moving on, visiting his friends, writing letters. And it's in that 10-year interval that he wrote the book that we've read today. I want to introduce you to two of Freddie's friends from that interval. The first is Paul Ray. Paul Ray was a psychologist who grew fascinated with this new book on the origin of species by Charles Darwin. And Ray became convinced that we could understand the depths of the human mind using these new evolutionary tools by thinking about our deep history and the various selective forces 
that have been at play in that history, we can come to understand our own minds. Another of Nietzsche's friends from this era is Lou Salome. She was deep into psychoanalysis. The central idea here is that there are parts of the human mind unknown to their hosts. Feelings, desires, passions, beliefs that you do not know about, but they're in your head nonetheless. I think we can productively think of Nietzsche as a thinker who brings these two ideas together and remixes them with some important novelty as well. Thinking about the deep evolutionary history of ideas, yes, and also the parts of the human mind that are unknown even to us. But if only we could dig deep enough, we could put these together and understand why it is we feel the way we feel, why it is we have the moral concepts that we have, why it is that we judge or evaluate in the way that we do. In fact, Nietzsche wasn't just friends with Paul and Lou. He was friends with Paul and Lou. Paul Ray asked Lou to marry him, and she said no. But I will totally live with you if we allow another guy to live with us. That other guy was Freddie, our friend. Now, unfortunately for Freddie, he also fell in love with Lou and asked her to marry him, and she said no. So he was kind of a third wheel for the rest of the time together. He finally got her alone again, asked her the question again, and she said no. <laughs> so you can see the body language here if we do the green lines. <laughs> Nietzsche was definitely the third wheel here, and not entirely happy about that, as you might guess. We'll fast forward another 10 years. Nietzsche was traveling and arrived in Turin, and he encountered in the streets there a cabbie mercilessly beating a horse. Overcome with emotion, Nietzsche threw himself between the whip and the horse and embraced the animal. And something snapped in him. He collapsed and he was never quite the same again. He would spend the next 10 years of his life mostly under the care of his sister, writing deranged letters to intellectuals across Europe. And then 10 years later, he would die. Here's what Nietzsche said about Nietzsche. First, he wrote an autobiography, and this is the title he chose, Ece Homo. Do you know those words? Behold the man. This is what Pontius Pilate said when presenting Jesus of Nazareth for crucifixion to the crowd. Nietzsche is claiming for himself a Christ-like status. Behold the man, behold me, he says. I'm a kind of Christ figure. So now I think we know what that letter of recommendation did to poor Nietzsche's head. Here are some chapter titles from that book. Why I'm so wise. Why I'm so clever. Why I write such good books. You get a feel for the kind of dude this was? If you want a quick summary of the book we're reading today, Look at pages 312 through 313 of the Kaufman edition, which you've been assigned. If you only have the PDFs online, you're going to have to search uh, for the, the rest of this. So here's what Nietzsche says about himself. I know my fate. One day my name will be associated with a memory of something tremendous, a crisis without equal on earth, the most profound collision of conscience. I'm no man. I'm dynamite. I read for you this paragraph to remind you of something. Look at the subtitle of genealogy of morals. It is a polemic. Nietzsche is given to hyperbole, metaphor, illusion, bombast. He often overstates his case or distracts us with rhetorical flourishes. And sometimes the rhetorical flourishes are the point. But here's what I think is helpful for you as a reader to know. If you're not agitated, you're not paying attention. This is a man who wants to upset you in some way, to arouse you not just to thought, but perhaps to feeling and to action. He wants to have an effect on the reader. A few pro tips about how to read Nietzsche well. Nietzsche gives us advice, in fact, in the preface. He says, one thing is necessary above all if one is to practice reading as an art, something that has been unlearned most thoroughly nowadays, and therefore, it will be some time before my writings are readable. Something for which one has almost to be a cow, in any case, not a modern man, Rumination. Now, when we read a text as dense and rhetorically interesting and complicated as Nietzsche's, I think it's sometimes tempting to ask this question. What does this mean? I want to suggest for you that this is not the best or most useful question with which to begin. And to get you a feel for what I'm thinking here, I actually want to read you a poem about poetry. I asked them to take a poem and hold it up to the light like a color slide. 
or press an ear against its hive. I say, drop a mouse into a poem and watch him probe his way out. Or walk inside the poem's room and feel the walls for a light switch. I want them to water ski across the surface of a poem, waving at the author's name on the shore. But all they want to do is tie the poem to a chair with rope and torture a confession out of it. They begin beating it with a hose to find out what it really means. Sometimes asking the question, what does this mean, distracts us from all the other interesting things that are there. So let me suggest for you an alternative question. Instead of what does this mean, ask, what do I notice? What can I see that is there? If I slow down and attend to the text in front of me, what do I see? So we look at this passage, here are some things I notice. I notice that Nietzsche says reading is an art. Interesting, perhaps not a science. Perhaps there's an aesthetic dimension to reading well. He says that it has been unlearned. So something about modernity, the condition in which Nietzsche's people in time, and perhaps us too, found ourselves, makes us inapt readers. We have to fight something about the social world and the modern world in which we live to actually get to the heart of the matter. And he says, finally, we must be like cows to ruminate. So here, our minds are the cow's stomach, I suppose, and the grass is the idea. And we chew. We chew. That means thinking about a word or a phrase, one word or phrase at a time, and then thinking about it again, just as a cow does with the cud. One thought here. Discerning the meaning of a text is often difficult. It requires philological chops and philosophical chops and historical knowledge. Sometimes this may be beyond us. It really is. But you know what's not beyond us? Noticing. Who can notice? You can, in fact. You can notice the text. You can look and slow down one word or one phrase at a time. And if that fails you, you can notice your own reactions to the text. And you can ask, why did I have this reaction? What was it in the text that made me feel or think this way rather than that? This is a powerful tool, and I think it's especially helpful with Nietzsche. Not what does it mean, but what do you notice? Nietzsche is easy to misread. All too easy. Now here's one kind of misreading which has been historically common and influential, in fact, which is to see Nietzsche as an anti-Semite nationalist, a philosophical grandfather of the Holocaust, and a kind of proto-Nazi moral monster. Now, I'll say something later about what I think is wrong with this interpretation, but on the surface of it, it's just too simple. Of course, Nietzsche says awful things about Jews, but he also says awful things about Christians, and about Germans, and about philosophers, and about psychologists, and about Englishmen and Frenchmen, and about European people in general, and about non-European in general. So there's something else going on here that I don't think this simple diagnosis and the the line connecting Nietzsche to Nazis, it just doesn't quite work. But some defenders of Nietzsche, including the author of the translation you've read today, have basically attempted to argue that the opposite is the case, that in fact Nietzsche is an anti-anti-Semite who's using irony and other techniques to make fun of anti-Semites, and that he's an anti-nationalist. Now, I don't think that simple interpretation works quite right either, because Nietzsche does say these nasty things, and it's not always ironically. Here's a famous picture some of you may have perhaps seen if you Google image search for Nietzsche and Nazi or Nietzsche and Hitler. This is a picture of Hitler in the museum that Nietzsche's sister ran for him after his death. And she brought Hitler in and for about five minutes he was in a room with this bust of Nietzsche on the right. And so Nietzsche's sister took that picture. And this has been often used as a symbol of the connection between Nietzsche and Nazi Germany. Now, It's an interesting picture, a great historical artifact to think about and its origins and how this came to be, but I think it's actually distracting. So uh, perhaps I shouldn't have shown it to you, but it's too interesting not to, right? Now there's another kind of misinterpretation that I want to warn you against. This is the Nietzsche one will encounter on the internet. Bros of various kinds have found Nietzsche attractive and attribute to him, in general, two kinds of views. First, there's a kind of sophomoric relativism or perspectivalism according to which anything goes that there aren't really truths, it's more a matter of how we see things. And second, there's a kind of strong man fetish fixated on the will to power. So what really matters in the good life is not finding the truth. Instead, it's affirming your own life 
and choosing power over others. Now, there's a lot of things wrong with Internet Nietzsche. I'll just share with you a few quotations showing that it just can't quite work out right. Despite the polemics, Nietzsche in fact aspires to be a serious person. He is not a buffoon in the way that Internet Nietzsche bros think that he is. He acknowledges that there, are, that there are truths. He says, I hope from my heart that these investigators and microscopists of the soul have trained themselves to sacrifice all desirability to the truth, every truth, even plain, harsh, ugly, repellent, unchristian, immoral truth, for such truths do exist. Some theories are better than other, and Nietzsche uses the method of hypothesis testing, comparing one hypothesis against another to see which is more responsible to the data before us. Some views, he says, are out of touch with reality, including Christianity. Senses are the guide to reality and truth. And he praises here science, that it's in science we possess precisely the testimony of the senses. The rest is miscarriage, in which reality is not encountered at all. And that all evidence of truth comes from the senses. So Nietzsche is not some buffoon who just thinks anything goes, intellectually speaking. We must be responsible to the evidence. It is not just a game of power. That said, Internet Nietzsche does get something right. There's a theme in both rhetoric and content of Nietzsche, which I think we can first approach by actually looking at art that's been inspired by Nietzsche. So I want to share with you a famous piece of music, which was inspired by one of Nietzsche's books, and then we'll see what we notice. Pretty cool, huh? What did you notice? Here's what I heard. A lone theme striking out and then rejected by the rest of the orchestra. Those are the trumpets in tandem. The orchestra rejects it two or three times, and each time, each time adds dissonance to the theme. But that lone voice in the beginning, separate, different from everyone else, in the end, triumphs, and everybody else agrees with them. So it kind of achieves power over the rest of the orchestra. Here is Nietzsche's preferred word for this phenomenon. He calls it the virtue of contempt. Now here's the first stage of analysis. Nietzsche has contempt for Jews, for Christians. This is the small brain version of the idea. Because we need to see that Nietzsche has contempt for everyone. And as a consequence, Nietzsche has contempt for himself. 
and he thinks this is a virtue. Why? Contempt allows us to laugh at ourselves. Contempt allows a ridiculous person to know that he is ridiculous and perhaps to grow, to change the world, and even bend the rest of the world in accordance with his new ways. Great book here by my friend Mark Alfano discusses the virtue of contempt in Nietzsche. I've said a bit about how not to read Nietzsche. I've identified one key theme which is helpful to focus on. Now I want to think about what Nietzsche was on about, both in his program as a whole, as well as in the book before us. In a word, I think of Nietzsche as a scientist of moral affect and cognition. So affect are moral feelings, like disgust or blame or disapprobation. And then cognition are judgments about what's good, bad, right, wrong. And his central tool is the genealogical method, peering into the origins, the histories of our ideas and cognitions. And I'll leave it as an open question what the end game is here. That is the ultimate purpose towards which Nietzsche bends these tools. So a word about genealogy. In Nietzsche's hands, genealogy is closely related to philology. He himself was a professor of philology, not of philosophy. You may or may not have heard that word before, philology. Now, I once said in a lecture like this, philology is dead. And one of my colleagues over there is like, no, it's not. Andrew, I'm a philologist. <laughs> okay, so philology is not dead. But philology, they're, they're not departments of philology anymore. And it's kind of been split into various academic disciplines as we know them now. But in Nietzsche's day, what he did was something like a blend of historical linguistics, classics, literary criticism, and straight-up normative philosophy with a little bit of social science and philosophy of social science thrown in for good measure. So it was one of these, now we would call this an interdisciplinary field. But that, that, that was Nietzsche's game, that was his training. And Nietzsche maintained, contrary to others of his time, that philology was in fact a science, that it could be done well or not well. And the way he understood this was that humanity itself was a text, the eternal basic text of human nature. Now you might think that if human nature is a text, that anything goes. After all, with some other texts, there are lots of different ambiguities and different ways to read them. This is not how Nietzsche thinks about correct textual interpretation. In fact, the existence of deeply incompatible ways of reading a single text is evidence of mediocre philology. Son, you just need to learn more Latin. You need more Greek, and you need to read some tragedies, and then you will understand that there's one way and only one way to read this text, my way, of course. So central to Nietzsche's intellectual project was to correct what he saw as misreadings of the text of human nature. Which parts of human nature were he concerned with? I think there are two that concern us today. First, there is evaluation, and we see this most centrally in the first essay of genealogy. This is our practice of labeling things, good, bad, right, wrong, and not just bad, but also evil. And we like to do this, do we not? We take great pleasure in categorizing each other as good or bad, right or wrong, evil. This is something deep in human nature, this disposition we have to evaluate. And then we also praise and reward or blame and punish. So we mete out various social goodies and even death to those who please or displease us. That's what essay two is concerned with, that element of the text of human nature. As I see it, genealogy has three, consists in three related questions. There's the history question, which is, what are the distal and proximate causes of a target phenomenon? So we isolate a practice, a moral thought, a moral feeling, and then we ask, what are its nearby causes? What are its much older causes? Then we ask about interests. That is, who stands to gain or to lose from the fact that we have this word in our vocabulary, this concept in our heads, or this feeling in our hearts? Who does it benefit? Who does it harm? And third, we need a cognitive mechanism 
That is, we need a hypothesis about how this actually came to be in terms of the psychological processes or mechanisms that generated these moral thoughts, ideas, feelings. A few quick examples. In recent years, propaganda here has assured us that we can be steady. Why? Well, the proximate cause is easy, is it not? We live in unsteady times. We need to be calmed down. And so we are calmed down. There's a slightly more distant cause, too, which is that we're still in the process of nation building. In living memory, Singapore did not exist, and even after its existence was on the brink of non-existence. With that kind of historical context, perhaps it's unsurprising that the need for steadiness would be apparent, even in the videos and advertisements paid for by the government during COVID-19. Second, we turn to the idea of interests. That's my dad and his chickens. He's an organic farmer. My dad likes to sometimes get online and argue with people about proper eating, clean food, unclean food. And sometimes they respond, Mr. Bailey, why do you care so much that people eat organic? And then they click on his Facebook page, oh, you're an organic farmer, I see. They're doing just a little bit of genealogy there, saying where did this idea, this distinction between clean food and unclean food come from, and who does it benefit? Well, it benefits organic farmers. We can unite these two methods of analysis in ways that are perhaps familiar. When we consider the history of a phenotype and then the ways in which it may or may not have helped an organism or species survive, and where survival is a kind of interest. It's to the benefit of a species to survive. Finally, we turn to cognitive mechanism, and perhaps some of the most famous examples here derive from Freud. So Freud wanted to know, why do people believe in God? And he posited this cognitive mechanism or psychological doodad in our heads, wish fulfillment. We all want fathers who care for us. You want some big guy who's going to be there for you. So it's a wish. And then the human brain happily supplies us with the fulfillment of that wish. Therefore, we believe in God. So the cognitive mechanism here helps us see not just who the belief benefits, but also how it came to be in terms of the details psychoanalysis, the stuff going on in the background in each of our heads. So again, we see these three questions. There's a question of history, of interests, and cognitive mechanism. I want to distinguish genealogy from a closely related intellectual project, which we might call debunking. Now, debunking is a kind of genealogy where the aim is to undermine. So for example, when someone gives evolutionary critiques of religion, and they say, ah, oh, the origin of religion is because it helped, not, not because there is a God or because any of this stuff is true, but rather because it helped early tribes coordinate behavior and have an in-group and an out-group where there's a high cost of being the in-group, so there's a, a signal being sent by group membership. And then the thought is, well, this makes religion somehow intellectually suspect. So that is a kind of debunking explanation of religion. But not all the genealogy is debunking. And to see this, just think about familiar evolutionary explanations of our cognitive capacities to recognize patterns, color discrimination, theory of mind, and so on. Knowing the origin, the interests, and the cognitive mechanisms at play here doesn't mean that we can't, in fact, recognize patterns and see colors. It just helps us to see how that came to be. So it needn't be debunking. It needn't come from this skeptical place. Now, if you've been paying attention, you might have a question here. Is this a genetic fallacy? Whereas this is a, an informal fallacy whereby one critiques something by critiquing its origin. Replacing the idea under the microscope with its origin and then critiquing the origin. Now, in general, this is more of a rhetorical distraction than a legit logical move to make. So, for example, one might say early advocates of reproductive freedom had eugenic ambitions, therefore pro-choice views are morally repugnant. That just doesn't follow. Of course, maybe some good people, some bad people, some people in between or neither have had all sorts of views about abortion. And which people have the views doesn't tell us whether the views are true or false. That's a matter of the evidence before us, the arguments that can be marshaled for or against a pro-life or pro-choice position. Now, here's a related technique that you may have encountered in person. You say something and someone replies, well, you only say that because you're a blank because you're Chinese, because you're rich, 
because you're gay, because you're straight, because you're a Singaporean, and so on. This is known in some circles as bulverism. And you can get a good feel for what the problems for that might be if you look up, there's a classic essay about this. Now, I've called it a fallacy, and yet I, I want to note that Marx, Freud, and Nietzsche routinely and apparently really like these kinds of techniques. They like to point not just to what makes an idea false, but, but sometimes they don't even talk about that. Instead, just talk about who had the idea. They've hence been known as the masters of suspicion. Did Nietzsche know better? In fact, he did. He says here, even if a morality has grown out of an error, if its origins are dubious, the realization of this fact would not so much as touch the problem of its value. So I think a good reading of Nietzsche will have him saying something more interesting than just a genetic fallacy. It's going to be a little bit more deep than that. So here's a challenge for you as a reader. Can you interpret Nietzsche such that he's debunking without fallacy? Or perhaps doing genealogy without debunking? Or... Uh, and, and so on. I'm going to close with a few thoughts about a concrete application of this genealogical method that we see in essay one of our book. Nietzsche begins in the preface by saying he wishes to articulate a new demand, a critique of moral values, where the value of these values themselves is called into question. It's an interesting hypothesis or thought or experiment to call into question the value of values. How does he do that? There's some questions to think through. In particular, in what ways does Nietzsche uncover the history, background interests, and cognitive mechanisms behind our moral feelings and thoughts? So this is a way to get a little deeper into the text, just to ask those three questions about a particular moral phenomenon that he's identified. Do we identify which values are under the microscope and figure out, is he debunking or is he doing something else? And can we reconstruct those arguments so as to avoid genetic fallacy? So those are some questions for you to consider in your own reflection time and in seminar. But here's my take on what's happening in essay one. The moral phenomenon under the microscope is slave morality. The replacement of master morality via the slave revolt, with more or less its opposite. Where good no longer means strong, but good now means weak. So it's Christian ethics, in other words, where the best way to love is to die, and where the central symbol of our hope is a symbol of torture, of humiliation, of death. And Nietzsche says, when we ask the history question here, we see origins in Jewish and Christian theology and ethics. It's the slave revolt that happened. First, when the Jews went into exile, left their slavery behind, and especially with the arrival of Jesus of Nazareth, who started a small Jewish cult that eventually became its own religion. We can ask here, who does this benefit? In whose, whose interests are promoted by this slave revolt, this new moral system? And Nietzsche's answer here is simple. It's designed by and for slaves. It's designed to pump them up to make their oppressors bad or better, evil. Yes, yes, the oppressors are not bad under slave morality. They are evil instead. So the switcheroo here is replacing bad with evil, a different kind of moral concept. And introducing that moral concept where someone being an oppressor makes them not just bad but evil, that benefits those who are oppressed. It benefits the weak. It assigns them high moral status. It's a complete switcheroo. And the central cognitive mechanism here is ressentiment, which is a fancy French word for resentment. Have you ever seen somebody who's better than you at something and you just knew you'd never be as good as they were? You just couldn't beat them. Now, if you are a normal person, you've encountered this before, and if you're honest with yourself, there's a little part of your heart that hated them for it. There's a little part of you that resented the fact that somebody else was stronger or faster or better or smarter than you. That is the seed, the cognitive mechanism that generates slave morality, the seething resentment. And so we see 
that the ideas of Paul Ray and Lou Salome, Freddie's old friends, are united here because we have both a historical or evolutionary explanation of the origins of these cognitions or affects united with psychoanalysis, probing deep into our minds and hearts and finding things that may be hidden to us. Those who are full of resentment don't always know it. So if I asked, have you ever had this seething resentment and nobody raises their hand, Nietzsche would say, liars. <laughs> we are men of knowledge and yet we are not known to ourselves, as he says in the opening line of the preface. There are things going on in our minds and hearts that are hidden to us. Resentment is one of them, but it is there and it is why we have the moral concepts we have. I claimed at the beginning that Nietzsche's ideas apply to us, not in the abstract, but in the concrete, here and now. I'll close by reflecting on what that might mean. I'm a pretty serious Catholic. I'm an adult convert, in fact. And about 200 meters from where I stand, there's this crucifix. And in fact, just a few meters away from that crucifix is an even bigger one inside the church. I see this all the time. And here's the question that Nietzsche makes me think. What have I signed up for? Have I joined a death cult? Have I joined a religion that glorifies suffering? What does this do to my world, to my society? What does it do to my own heart to see this every time I go to Mass and to see weakness glorified? What did that do to humanity? So that's one way I think about these questions myself. I want to suggest that you can do the same, not with respect to a crucifix, but perhaps in ways that are quite salient to your life. So for example, have you ever hidden how easy a piece of homework was or an exam was? Have you hidden your strength? Have you claimed that it was harder for you than it really was? Have you ever not disclosed or hidden or otherwise not quite admitted how wealthy your parents are? How easy things have been for you? Instead, perhaps you've claimed various identities of oppression. Maybe there's a grain of truth, maybe not. If this has ever happened to you, and I submit that it has, perhaps Nietzsche can teach you something. So here's my question for you. What do you notice? Cheers. Cheers.